How do you go about making a distillery when the laws are not really amenable to that? Well, that's exactly what Koval Distilling encountered a decade and a half ago when they created the first new distillery in the city of Chicago since the 19th century. And that's exactly what we're going to be discussing on the 118th episode of The Jewish Shrinking Show, bringing L'Chaim to life. L'chaim. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest, Dr. Sona Bernecker Hart. Welcome, Dr. Hart. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. So for those less familiar with Dr. Hart here, she is... She co-founded the internationally award-winning distillery Koval Belt, which we're going to be discussing. As its president, she has spearheaded product development, distribution, and marketing. She also co-founded Koth Distilling Technologies, a distillery startup consulting firm. Prior to di her distilling experience, she received her doctorate, doctorate from the University of London with her dissertation on history through humor, the evocation of the Viennese Coffeehouse Society in Friedrich Torberg's, I'm going to say Tante Holesch, but that's totally, how, how is that pr pronounced? Tante Holesch. There we go. Dante Yolish. <laughs> Dante Yolish. Books with particular reference to the problems of assimilation and anti-Semitism. That is the title. And she has spent over a decade as a full professor of Jewish studies in both the United States and Germany, holding the Walter Benjamin Chair of German Jewish Cultural History at Humboldt University in Berlin. In 2008, she gave up tenure to co-found Koval. Dr. Bernd Eckerhart also currently serves as the chair of the steering committee of the JD Corps. So welcome, Dr. Hart. That's a lot. <laughs> it's it's all a joy so yes <laughs> but it's 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 such a pleasure to do it all all right so i'm going to go in an unconventional route instead of starting with the whiskey i have to ask about the academic piece so the last time i was in chicago was just this december for the annual ajs conference association of jewish studies and for so sure. do you so it's always fascinating for me there's a wide array of of you know, whether it's Talmud, history, Bible, you know, obviously more could be film studies. There's, there's a lot. So do you, first of all, did you totally give up academia? Do you still retain a connection to the academic enterprise? Does one ever give up studying? <laughs> I, I certainly don't. So no, okay. I, I would never say that I've given it up. How did you switch gears actually? <laughs> I mean, it's a, I would say it's sure. unconventional, but I don't know that anybody else has done it right. Switching from academia, Jewish academia to distillery. So how did that, how did that transition happen? That's not overnight. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel like, like Jews have a many, you know, almost thousands of years of history of having to switch their lives overnight. So I, I would say that this is, it was not new in general when it comes to Jewish history, but, but uh, for me, you know, one can always say that academia leads, leads to whiskey one way or another, <laughs> but uh, for me, it really all began. <laughs> You all know, roads, all roads lead to whiskey. All roads, okay. exactly. It's inevitable in, for sure. So, I, I mean, in 2007, when when uh, you know we started thinking about this, and the idea came about, was really when we were at a crossroads in our lives. And so, you know, we had very stable, secure careers. I was pregnant with our first child, um, but yet, you know, we were house hunting at the at a time that you know at least when the housing market was very similar uh, to what it is today. You know, houses. <laughs> were incredibly expensive, overpriced. Mm. They were hard to find. So yeah. every home we would look at was sort of as is or came with tags such as bring vision, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, after we left one home with a, you know, moldy basement, we said, you know what? Maybe this just isn't what we should be doing. Maybe we shouldn't be settling down here. Maybe we should be thinking about what we really truly want for our lives. Hmm. And we started, you know, thinking about that sort of very philosophically and, and, and also practically we said, yeah. okay, we would love to be in a place that is important to us that we, that, that we love, you know, place became for me, Chicago. I'm from Chicago. And also it was important to me because I wanted to be close to family and my parents were getting older. Hmm. And I think that, you know, in my generation, you know, a lot of people are, are facing these kinds of questions, you know, how do you take care of your parents mm -hmm. um, as they need help uh, at this later stage in life? And, and also I was about to have a baby. It, the idea of being close to my parents with a brand new baby was really exciting for me. Also the idea of changing things, was, was also interesting. I mean, hmm. you know, sometimes people get very stuck, not that they're stuck in a bad way. They, they might be stuck in a great place, but <laughs> they don't entertain 
what else could be possible? And, mm -hmm. and certainly it's hard to do that after a lot of education and after investing time and certainly money into getting to a certain place and, and in, in a particular career. But we start thinking, okay, what's more important than you know, the, the achievements that we've, we've gotten from our career. Well, being mm. close to family might be more important, um, being able to be with our children, you know, in, in a, you know, a more daily basis might be more important, uh, being able to work with each other might be more important. And so mm. we started thinking about all these things. Also not commuting might be more important. <laughs> I mean, going, if you've ever gone up 95, like, you know, between Baltimore and DC, you know, every day, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you get very intimate with NPR, but after a while, you, know, you might think that there's something better out there. So we decided that it was the time to make a change and life can have many chapters. And so we just gave it up and said, okay, what can we do now together in the city we love close to family? And did, we did started- you, So you're originally from Chicago? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Yes, yes I am. So, Midwestern, so that was sort right. of- yeah, definitely Midwestern. So, <laughs> so that was sort of, you know, the whole origin of it in, in that. And, and then we started looking into what we could do and we looked into our strengths. So obviously, as you mentioned, Viennese coffee houses are mm -hmm. certainly in my wheelhouse. This, the problem is, is there was already a Viennese coffee house in Chicago. Meinl had started a coffee house in 2007 in Chicago. In fact, mm -hmm. a few of them. And so we're like, all right, that's been done. So mm -hmm. we started thinking, what else could we do? And it was a time in which craft brewing had been very, very popular, mm -hmm. uh, but was reaching really almost a peak. Uh, and craft distilling hadn't really really gotten, you know, the same kind of legs that craft brewing had, and it wasn't running mm. yet. It was still sort of at a walking, uh, walking Wait, this, stage. You're saying 2007, 2008? Yes. At that time in the United States, there were under, I think, 40 distilleries in the entire U.S. No, no, no. And I'm really thinking about brewing because there was an explosion oh, no, between 2008, oh, yeah. 14, and then still even more. Oh, yeah. Even more. But it was yeah. already uh, of, growing. Best. Okay. It was already very established. I mean, okay. you could go anywhere and find a craft brewery, yeah. but you could not. You certainly couldn't find a craft distillery. Mm. And in part because there were fewer than 40 distilleries in the entire United States at the time. And most of them were controlled by about eight different companies. And in addition to that, you know, there wasn't the same luxury that brewers had, which was that they could practice at home. If you did that mm. with distilling, it was a federal offense. Yeah. So, you know, which could damper one's aspirations. Mm. You know, I, if, I'm, I'm just surprised you know. that only a, cent, a decade and a half ago, there were that few distilleries. There's been a, clearly an explosion in the last decade and a half. For sure, but we're still not at more than a bit over 4,000. So, wow. I mean, know, there's, there's still a lot of demand. There's still a lot of consumer oh, demand. Yeah. Absolutely. There yeah. is. And in fact, a study was recently uh, commissioned to determine if you know, by, by a bunch of banks to determine if, you know, we've reached, you know, the, the peak the of that saturation. And we certainly haven't. Yeah. yeah we're not oh, wow. nearly at a saturation point, but wow. I mean, if you think about it, <laughs> the population of, of the greater Chicagoland area is similar mm -hmm. to the population of Austria. And in Austria, there are over 25,000 distilleries. So <laughs> I think there's room. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. Wow. That's so, impressive. But, uh, yeah. But okay. So you started, decided I mean, that it was, it was yeah. a good market to enter. It was a great market to enter. We also had the know-how. My husband comes from many generations of distillers in Austria. His grandfather oh, wow. has a functioning cider uh, company and they make brandy, many different kinds mm. of brandies and liqueurs. And so he grew up doing this as chores. And so it became, <laughs> you know, we, we, we had the know-how, uh, but that didn't mean we knew how to start a distillery in America. So we went mm. into full research mode, also figuring out how to make sure that we were uh, compliant. You know, having an uh, compliant, well, not just compliant, but yeah. also going above and beyond being compliant for organic certification being compliant for kosher certification. So all of these things were very important for us. And, uh, and in doing all this research, we realized we would go for it. And, and uh, you know, it, Chicago hadn't had a distillery since the mid 1800s. <laughs> and so there really weren't any laws on the books for what it, you know, for, you know, small distilling operations. Which, really? So how was, I mean, I was, Chicago. I was, a, before you said this last piece, I was about to ask, how has it been as the first new, you know, distillery since the 19th yeah. century? But on top of that, 
how how was the dance around the legalities? I mean, I imagine that it could be like the Wild West. That there's not really a lot of limitations, but on the other hand, right. was that easy or hard? It's both because, you know, on the one hand, you know, you can always do something and say sorry later, which is sort of the Chicago way. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, if if you ask and you want to do something and there aren't really specific laws to regulate it, you know, no, who, no one wants to take responsibility for doing anything, you know, mm. unless it's really codified and, and that's understandable. Mm -hmm. And so while we were legally allowed to manufacture alcohol, we were not legally allowed or there was certainly nothing in the books for us being able to do tours, tastings, or retail on site. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of limitations in what we were able to do. And also the laws were very specific to mass scale distilleries, like the kind you had in Peoria at the turn of the century, when mm -hmm. Peoria was the, the, you know, nexus of distilling in America before Kentucky. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the costs of the licenses were very high because they were assuming you were making like millions of gallons. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so, you know, that needed to be adjusted. And so I had to go to Springfield and make some changes. Mm -hmm. So I changed the law. We, I created the first uh, with Heather Steens and Greg Harris, who was my house rep and my senator. Mm -hmm. uh, we created the first craft distiller's license for the state of Illinois. And since wow. then, it completely changed the landscape in our state and made it possible for a lot of different kinds of businesses to enter into the scene, both distilleries that focus on distribution like Koval, but also distilleries that really a lot of the main thrust of their business is a bar or a restaurant. But none mm -hmm. of that was possible before. So, because th those would use on-premise sales, but for working with the legislators, how did did you have like a, I don't know, not a lobbyist, but did you have like a lawyer to help you? Like, did you no. just literally say you represent me in the state? How can we make this better for everybody? Look, we all pay taxes. Everybody works for us. I mean, yeah. lobbyists like to like to you know they, they're good at their craft certainly, and they have all the mm -hmm. connections, but it doesn't mean you can't do it yourself. So, you know, I worked with my senator, I worked with my house rep, we wrote up bills, we, we tried to see what the opposition would be, we found out that, you know, the opposition, certainly, it, it seemed a little bit like there were some conflicts of interest. But you know, this is Illinois, after all. And as I heard from, you know, a, a seasoned <laughs> Illinois, you know, legislator, when I when I brought up uh, some of my questions about conflicts of interest, he said, mm -hmm. there are two things you never want to see being made. And I said, what? He said, sausage and legislation. And so I was like, okay, <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's for sure. But imagine, but it I, I imagine it was pretty compelling to, to be able to argue, look, this will, there will be, you know, tax revenues for whether city, state, county, whatever it is. So, and, you know, just having employment jobs, I mean, revenue is good for everybody, right? So that was probably a you, big selling point. I, you could have worked for me at the time, <laughs> you know, those were great arguments. The problem yeah. was, is that uh, distributors don't want to lose any piece of the pie or mm -hmm. any bit of the revenue. And when they control, you know, all of the sale of alcohol, you know, essentially as a manufacturer at the time, you know, your hands were completely tied. If you didn't have a distributor, you weren't going to sell your product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I didn't get this law passed, I wouldn't be able to retail on site, but you know, that's taking uh, away revenue from the from, three tiered system, from the three tiered system. Mm -hmm. And so there, that was not looked upon with joy or interest at mm -hmm. all, but it ended up working out. And, uh, you know, and it, it was at a time in which uh, the, a lot of laws needed to be changed. And, and <laughs> there was a real domino effect across the nation mm -hmm. of small craft distillers seeing that other small craft distillers were getting laws changed, and they were getting inspired and changing it in their states as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are many states that allow some degree of self distribution, uh, there are not Illinois, but <laughs> other oh. ones. Um, and then, you know, there, there are states that allow, um, you know, varying levels of, you know, uh, retail on site. Some have caps of what you can retail on site. Mm -hmm. Some don't. So, I, I mean, but, but there's been a lot of change and it's been really a revolution in mm -hmm. the industry. For for some of those, especially two thousand seven, eight, and so forth, how much of it was just research on your own versus trying to connect with, like you were saying, changing legislation in other states a, a decade and a half ago? How much of that was sort of a, um, I don't know, sharing best practices or ideas? How much of was uh, was about connecting? 
Well, I always love to give someone credit when they help me. And, mm-hmm. and certainly Guy Rayhurst in Wisconsin was very helpful. Mm-hmm. He uh, owns Great Lakes Distillery. And I called him up and I said, how did you do it? <laughs> how did you change the laws in Wisconsin? And it took mm-hmm. him a while. Uh, he was working mm-hmm. at that for a while, but he managed to do it. And he gave me a lot of great advice. And of course, I went back to Illinois and said, come on, guys, should I move to Wisconsin? Or mm-hmm. would you like I me mean, to have my business here? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it you know, he was certainly uh, a mentor and was very kind with his time and his recommendations. And and that definitely helped me. And of course, you know, we passed it on and made similar recommendations to others in other states uh, to Mm. help them change the laws. There's got to be a lot of trickle down effects uh, as the years went on. Not that it was forever ago, it was a decade and a half ago, but with other states opening this up, obviously allowing more distillation operations taking place, allowing I don't know. I guess a rising oh, tide lifts sure. all ships. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and for sure. And, mm-hmm. you know, as articles started being written about craft brands and, and certainly as, as the Tribune wrote about Koval at the time, you know, we started getting numerous phone calls. There apparently mm-hmm. were lots of bootleggers and illegal, mm-hmm. you know, distillery operations all over the Midwest and beyond. Mm-hmm. And we would get these calls where, where someone would say, how did you do it? I've been making brandy <laughs> in my backyard for years, or I've been making whiskey for years. And I'd be like, don't say that too loudly. <laughs> that's going to get you in really big trouble. Yep. So, um, they said, well, I want to come clean. I want to do it for real. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as, as an educator, I would, I would be on the phone with someone for hours and I'd have a baby on me and I'd be trying to answer emails at the same time or, or pulling, you know, bags of grain to our mash tank. And it became very impractical after we had our 20th such phone call in a week. And so we started saying, come to our workshops. Ah. And we started our consulting company. So Coach of Distilling Technologies. Mm. And since, you know, it became a a wonderful opportunity for us to have a vertical business model. But in addition Mm. to that, we managed to educate over 3,500 people and how to start distilleries. They Mm. came from all over, not just the United States, but all over the world. We had people from Africa, the Middle East, Europe, Asia, you know, the Caribbean, I mean, literally all over the world. Um, they That's came so wild that there was such a pent up demand for that. There was, it's, wow. it was huge, huge. Hmm. And then we set up over 200 distilleries, turnkey operations for other craft distilleries, where we literally went in, we taught them how to do that. We, we got them their equipment. We set their equipment up. We got them going. Sometimes we even made product for them to hmm. get them started before they had product of their own. And uh, it was really amazing. We, we set up the largest distillery in Uganda, the first distillery in Jerusalem, <laughs> many distilleries in Europe, many in Canada, mm-hmm. many many, many, many in the Midwest and beyond. So it was Mm -hmm. really uh, an adventure and we learned a great deal and became, you know, part of a, of a community of, of, you know, distillers and those, you know, sort of in the industry Mm -hmm. that were really changing the way uh, distilling was, was practiced, so to Mm -hmm. speak, all over the world. Yeah. And are there a few highlights you can share? You said you learned a lot throughout that process. Are there a few highlights or Things that have, I well, don't know. I, I, we learned that we're, we don't necessarily want to go into the Baijiu business. I mean, we, we tried to make, uh, you know, somebody, we, we made Baijiu for somebody uh, yeah. that commissioned us and we, we, they wanted it done as authentically as possible. And so we did a deep dive and I mean, we were aging mm. in clay pots and we what were Baijiu? aging and also it's, it's a, it's a, it's a spirit that's very popular in China. Oh. Um, and, but it uses particular kinds of yeast. Uh, hmm. it uses also all, I mean, it is an adventure in itself, <laughs> but, um, that, that was, that was a real adventure, but probably I think we'll, we're going to, uh, you know, stick to whiskey and gin and <laughs> liqueurs and brandy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but you know, so that was a really fun one, but I would say, you know, a lot of the other adventures oh. are seeing other people succeed. Mm. And that was really the joy of it all. And one of the best parts of it is that, you know, we saw a lot of people succeed. We saw a lot of people, um, you know, 
we saw their, their families grow up and, and know that they'd be able to send their kids to college if they wanted to, or, Mm -hmm. you know, trade schools, which would probably be smarter. Um, you know, Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it was, it was really, uh, a a lot of fun and certainly we traveled the world. I mean, Hmm. both for our consulting as well as Koval, Koval, uh, went from just, you know, making it in Chicago to being available in about 55 export markets around the world. So for both, uh, you know, sides of the business, you know, we traveled all over the world. We set up distilleries in Japan. We also went to Japan for our own, you know, Mm -hmm. distribution and and selling our products and had wonderful um, adventures and met amazing people that are are making great products. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, getting to see other forms of fermentation like sake fermentation Mm -hmm. and, and the sake facilities. It was, it was great. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far with Dr. Hart. I wanted to break in and give you a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring another alcohol company, and this is Safona Winery in Toronto. Here we go. There's really only two, two countries that can reliably make actual ice wine. We'll mm-hmm. come back to what actual means. <laughs> um, oh, every, okay, that sounds contentious. But okay. It's contentious. <laughs> and that is really Canada and Germany. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek. And now back into this episode with Dr. Hart. It's nice hearing about other successes, but what, so you, you talked about the growth of Koval. So how did that, how, I imagine it like any distilled product, it was not immediate, but it sounds like you got attention after receiving some press. So how did, how was in the last decade and a half, obviously you had the legislative mm-hmm. hurdles to manage. So how did the growth right. happen? How has it been? And also I, I'm curious to also how it, measures up against the national trends uh, with not only demand, but like a heightened demand and continually growing demand. And how is right. that? I, I don't know if that really, like I mentioned earlier, the rising tide lifts all ships. So it's not as if, yes, there's competition, but at the same time, demand is demand, right? So people are still going to want sure. to have good products. So how has, how has the, obviously it's not a straight line up, right? There, there's mm-hmm. th- things happen. So how is so, yeah, COVID uh, happened. Um, but yeah, that yeah, there, there are a lot of things that happened. Also, trade tariffs happened. Uh, oh, we've yeah. had a lot of things happening <laughs> uh, over the, yeah. the past few years. So um, and, and, you know, we might have a recession happen, too. But, you know, I don't know. Alcohol is pretty happened. recession. Alcohol is pretty That's recession true. proof. It's true. Yes, it's, it is. It's yes, pandemic it is. proof. But, it is not necessarily war proof. So we're, we're, you know, no longer, uh, you know, selling in Russia oh, yeah. um, and our Ukrainian distributor is, is in America right now. I guess I'm curious to hear how the pandemic has been for Koval generally, but also how has, you know, how has that been within the 15 years or so of, of uh, by the way, when did sure. you start, when is the production 2008, 2008. Started producing mm-hmm. and when did you start releasing products? 2008, because oh, we started with like some gin. white whiskeys and oh, some brandies yeah. and, and some liqueurs as well. Mm-hmm. And how, yeah. how long do you generally age your whiskeys, like your bourbon, right? Absolutely. So our, you know, one of the things that uh, I'll just give you the whole philosophy, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, what we do is we do things a little bit differently than other distilleries. Okay. And we have the luxury of doing that because, you know, we're not making uh, for volume, you know, we're limited in the amount of volume we're allowed to produce. And because we came Chicago or Illinois rules, Illinois, Illinois, Illinois rules, we have a hundred thousand mm-hmm. gallons, proof gallons that we can make mm-hmm. a year. But aside from that, and that's true for a lot of craft distilleries, they're restricted to the amount oh, really? they're allowed to make. Yeah. Wow. And that, and, uh, and so what we, we, you know, wanted to do is we, we come from, and certainly Robert comes from a brandy making tradition mm-hmm. and that's brandy is incredibly popular in Europe, not very popular in America, unless mm-hmm. you live in Wisconsin. And I think everybody <laughs> Wisconsin drinks the most brandy out of any state in the United States. I mean, they use but brandy in old fashions. I mean, that's pretty wild. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. They sure do. You know, not what they do in Europe, um, but <laughs> in, anywhere in Europe, outside of Wisconsin. <laughs> that's true. That's true. When you make brandy in Switzerland or France or Austria or Germany or any of these places, um, you know, the Czech Republic, you make, uh, it's a, it's out of fruit, a hundred percent fruit. And you want only the purest part of the distillate Mm -hmm. in your bottle because it's not aged. So Mm -hmm. you don't want any of those tails 
Mm -hmm. in the bottle because they're going to sort of muddy the flavor. Um, for those that don't know, you know, it, everything comes off a still, whether you're distilling turnips or grain or apricots, it comes off the still heads, hearts, and tails heads, make you go blind and crazy. Hopefully nobody uses those. Uh, the, the hearts are the purest ethanol portion of what comes off the still. It's really the fillet of the distillate. That's mm -hmm. all we use at Koval. And then you have the tails, um, and the tails are not bad for you. They're just different chemical compounds, some of which you'd find in vinegar. Um, they're a little oilier, they're lower in alcohol content. And, uh, and so they taste different. Mm -hmm. If you put some of the tails and the hearts as many traditional American distillers do in a barrel and you age it, the barrel acts as a filter. And depending mm -hmm. on the level of char, you know, more or less, it adds more flavor to it. Uh, but you know, in that sense, you're using the barrel for multiple things. You're using it to filter out some of those off flavors that you get in the tails, mm -hmm. but you are also using it for the, the flavors that you get from the charring uh, and the wood itself. Now at Koval, we are not putting anything into a barrel that really requires any filtering at all because there mm. are no tails. It tastes beautiful as a white spirit, a white whiskey or a brandy. Uh, and so just for clarification, it's not, yes. it's, you're not saying that there are no tails that in your production, you just don't include any tails. In we your, don't include any tails. Uh, in but our heads spirit. and tails still right. happen. You just, you're only including. It still the happens. We're not, we're not a scientific okay. anomaly. We're, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 we're not. We're not, we're not. <laughs> You've hacked to science. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so we, we don't include them. So mm -hmm. for us, we are using the aging process to get those beautiful rounded flavors that you get from the charring of the barrel, mm -hmm. as well as the wood, but we're not requiring it for any filtering purposes. And, and we, because we're not adding any of the tails. And so there are fewer oilier components to it. Mm. You, we wouldn't want to over age it because we're going for this very bright, clean flavor at which you get in about four or five years. And that's our sweet spot. Mm. We don't pull it for age. We pull it for flavor within mm. that time frame. Um, sometimes, you know, it needs to go a little more, sometimes a little less. If for some reason there's a barrel that we find that is not within our flavor profile, because it just I don't know if because of the nature of the barrel or maybe mm -hmm. it was a really hot summer, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that, that it, it has, you know, extra cinnamon notes or extra, you mm -hmm. know, chocolatey notes or, mm -hmm. or macadamia nut or who knows what that might still be fabulous, but not within the flavor profile that we go for, for consistency mm -hmm. sake, it gets taken out and becomes part of a barrel program. So oh, we, cool. for that's sort of our philosophy behind aging and also distilling itself, really only using the heart cut of the distillate. And that is sort of what we uh, wanted to do. We wanted to apply the same attention to grain and using that hard cut as Robert's grandfather does for an apricot or a pear mm -hmm. or <laughs> an apple. So that's sort of one of the things that differentiates us uh, as a brand in America. And, and it's, you know, it's, there, there's some Japanese distilleries that also have this similar approach, which is probably why Koval does so well in Japan, mm. uh, because our products are just very bright and clean and, and mm. grain forward. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just different. It's not, you know, the, all these other products that do include tails there it's, I'm not making a value judgment better or worse. They're just, just different because mm -hmm. there are different chemical compounds in it. So it's like, what kind of pasta do you like? What's the sauce? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. they're there. It's just different. So mm -hmm. the other thing that kind of differentiates Koval as a brand is also the fact that, you know, we have a, a huge amount of uh, transparency in how we do things. I mean, all of our grains come locally from the Midwest. We work with specific farmers uh, all the time and they grow grain specifically for us. Part of this oh, really? also was oh, yeah, neat. out of necessity that's because really cool. when we first started and, mm -hmm. you know, we use millet for our bourbon. So that, Nashville's that blew me away. Yeah. Cause we, uh, I tasted all the, you know, some of that, including the, uh, the bourbon last night. And so it blew me away. I totally was thinking multi, you know, there's gotta be some malted barley here. It was literally 51% corn, everything else millet. That was yes. uh, pretty wild. How did you come up with millet for the bourbon? 
Well, you know, we wanted to be unique. Uh, you know, we figured the big guys have been doing it uh, well for, mm -hmm. you know, generations and mm -hmm. they use some of the usual suspects, malted mm -hmm. barley, yep. rye, wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, and we said, well, there are other grains too. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're lovely. You know, why <laughs> not? you know, do something completely different and make Chicago have its own flavor profile. And so we decided to go with millet in part because millet is a very uh, helpful grain. Not only is it uh, really tasty and it has like, um, you know, uh, almost, you know, an earthiness to it. It's, mm. it's a very popular grain in many other countries, just not here unless you're mm -hmm. a parakeet. Um, or you, mm -hmm. you like gluten-free grains because it appears in a lot of gluten-free grains mm -hmm. because millet is gluten-free, but, uh, it's also a grain that is basic as opposed to acidic and mm -hmm. it is a rotation crop. And so mm -hmm. in using millet, we're also able to be benevolent to the land and, and, mm -hmm. you know, being that, you know, uh, I am very into my Jewish heritage and identity. And a large part of that is a strong relationship with land. It's a strong relationship with soil. It's a strong relationship with the seasons. It's a strong mm -hmm. relationship with what grows when and, and why that's important. And, and that we notice these things. We have a holiday just for trees. I mean, we have a real connection to agriculture that I think is, is really important. And as sort of an agricultural people, uh, I think that, you know, working with grains that also are helpful to the soil and benevolent to the land was important you know, as opposed to just taking, also giving the land something too uh, with our whiskey was nice. All right. So I have, I have two, uh, three other questions about the products, as well as wanting to ask about kosher certification. Hopefully we can knock these out in the next five minutes or so. Sure. Uh, um, sure. Uh, all right. So speaking of grains, uh, you know, I'm just going to ask all three of the questions at once. The four grain, I was very excited because I love oats in beer. I, I love, I, I love oated beers. So to have an right. oated whiskey was fun surprising and i'm curious and i'm just going to park this how many like are there a lot of whiskeys out there that involve oats so that's one that's one question the second sure. question is the not the dry gin but the barrel aged gin that was such an incredible obviously can go well in cocktails maybe for a negroni but it's an incredible sipper on its own so how did you come up with that finally this cranberry liqueur gin fascinating incredible like it is so enjoyable. Obviously, it's incredible with some seltzer or something um, to spritz it up. It, it retains a tartness. It's such a fun beverage. So, how did you come? What what's sort of uh, the idea behind all of these? Sure, that's a I lot. Mean, to knock them out. all out. No yeah. worries. Oat whiskey, it was also our desire to work with other grains. We love the creaminess of oat. We make a 100% mm -hmm. oat whiskey. You do? We loved it. Yeah, How is that? Do. Is, is it it's harder hard process-wise? Like on it's, your end, the production-wise, is it the, harder? The most difficult whiskey to produce is rye. And we use really? uh, only rye in our rye, <laughs> which is yeah, yeah. quite unique. Most ryes mm -hmm. on the market are 51% rye and the rest mm -hmm. something else. Our rye whiskey is 100% rye. Mm -hmm. And that is because for our process, we love using uh, individual grains so that people can taste exactly what the grain tastes like, you know? Yeah. So for example, you wait, know, wait, wait, quick question, but the mm -hmm. oat, sure. the, so the oat is easier to make than the rye. Yes, it is actually. Really? Mm -hmm. So how come Rye's other distilleries, so how come other distilleries aren't pumping Oat's out more oat? expensive? Uh, oh, it's okay. very expensive. It's more expensive than uh -huh. wheat. It's more expensive than a lot of other grains. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, 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 I mean, it is very viscous. The easiest is millet. Millet is like vanilla frosting when you mash it. I mean, it's wow. incredibly lovely to work with as opposed huh. to rye um, or oat. But I mean, for hmm. us, it was really about providing people with different flavor adventures than they're mm -hmm. used to. And maybe they'll yeah. find something that they really like that they didn't know was out there. And that's true for our bourbon and everything else. Do you know if your bourbon has inspired other distillers out there to involve millet a little bit more in their bourbon Maybe, creations? but since we started using millet, the cost has gone up about eightfold. And that's why we have a oh. farmer growing it just for us. <laughs> because I think Kellogg, 
wants to, and other companies that, that want millet for cereals and gluten-free cereals mm. are buying it all up. I mean, oh, wow. it's yeah. The, the days of, of millet being on the down low are over. So <laughs> I, <laughs> you, I'm not you, sure. You exposed it to the, to uh, America. Uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, oat whiskey was really about creating a flavor adventure, a whiskey that has sort of a creamy mouthfeel, one that is, uh, you know, super approachable, drinkable, tastes great in sort of a oat Manhattan. Um, and so that's what we wanted to do oh with regard God. to the, the barrel. I'm excited gin to try that. And, <laughs> oh yeah. With regard to our barrel gin, you know, yeah. our gins in general, when we, we came to gin later, mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies start with the gin because they yeah. buy in base alcohol and then they distill it with botanicals. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a great way to get a business going. But for us, you know, we, we actually originally didn't like gin. And so we, we gave oh. ourselves an assignment. <laughs> Let's create a gin that we would like to drink at mm. room temperature mm -hmm. um, by itself. Mm -hmm. And so that was our assignment and we oh. achieved it. And actually I love our gin. I love all of our gins. And so what we did, love that was all your gins equally. <clears throat> I love do. All, all yeah. equally. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so what we did that was different for our gins is that we uh, made the base alcohol ourselves. The base alcohol is a rye white whiskey. So it already comes to the table with flavor and aroma. Mm. Then it goes through a maceration process uh, mm -hmm. with the botanical sort of a cold press, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then we do a distillation with the botanicals and we do not use a gin basket. The botanicals go directly in the still. Uh, we get a lot of flavor, a lot of aroma. I think it would make a fabulous perfume if it mm -hmm. would, you know, raise a few eyebrows because it does sort of smell like gin, obviously, but it is, yeah. it's just has such a lovely floral component to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we wanted to use different uh, flavors in it. We've got a lot of rose hip in it, as opposed to some of the normal citrus oh. elements. Hmm. So yeah. while rose hips have that kind of tart citrusy note, it's not the same as using a lot of, you know, bitter orange or, or lemon mm -hmm. peel. And so so, so yeah. I'm guessing that the barrel aged version was, you know, based off of that theme or that desire to make something. I mean, I'm drinking everything room temperature, but to have something yes. on its own, obviously it could yes. be incredible in a cocktail, but on, I'm this, I mean, this gin is just is so incredibly, I mean, even the, the regular dry gin for sure, but the barrel aged gin is that's fun. Yeah. I mean, what we wanted was a bridge. We wanted a mm. bridge between gin and whiskey mm -hmm. so that you have like a nice sipper and yeah. that you're able to enjoy it. Um, but that it is really, uh, versatile and that you could use it in a Negroni, you know, you could mm -hmm. use it in, in many different cocktails. So it's, it's very a useful. really fun variation. Yes. It's really, very all, useful. really all of your gins yeah. are quite useful, versatile. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. On own For cocktails, sure. which leads sure. me of course to the cran gin. Yeah. This is so fun. I mean, uh, this is just fun. Like it's tart, it obviously, <laughs> you know, we, it, it's, it, uh, it's incredible for the fall, November, Thanksgiving, yes. but probably year round. And it's pretty approachable, little tartness, throw in some seltzer. Yes. How'd you come up with this? Inspiration was Italy. Uh, obviously oh, really? the Italians, they, they love their aperitivos and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have numerous kinds of sort of cocktails, um, that, that have a liqueur base. Um, they mix in spark, something sparkling, anything sparkling, mm. a sparkling tonic, a sparkling wine, mm. a champagne, a, mm. um, a mixture, sometimes sparkling water and a little bit of champagne or, yeah. you know, all of that, uh, you see all over Italy in very large wine glasses topped with some sort of, <laughs> you know, wedge of a citrus, fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we are Italian uh, distributor, we were talking and, you know, we've been talking with, you know, uh, a lot of, of people about, you know, what would be a great American answer to the Italian aperitif mm -hmm. uh, culture and aperitivo. And so we said, well, cranberries are very American. Mm -hmm. And not just that, you know, I mean, they're native to America, but, but in addition to that, you know, they're Midwestern. We, we get all of our cranberries uh, just an hour or two away from the distillery in, in cranberry bogs. And it's a really fun way to add a Midwestern twist to mm -hmm. sort of this Italian aperitivo culture and create many delicious cocktails. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you think, 
Thanksgiving, you can mix it with some sort of sparkling wine or just uh, seltzer or, and I mean, it's just the color is beautiful and all natural, obviously. And so I feel like, and you can even do a mulled version, which would be great. So Hmm, all of that's incredible. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also if you have topics as well as uh, potential guests, including who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you. And now back into the show. Dr. Hart, I'm very excited to ask, of course, putting my rabbi hat on, kosher certification. You mentioned earlier back in a, a decade and a half ago, you were thinking about certification. So how has that process been uh, with OU? We love them. I mean, we, we yeah. love, I mean, OU, OU has been fabulous. I mean, by the way, I will it's, say it's, it's, it's prominently displayed, especially on the whiskeys and it's noticeable on the gins, even the liqueur. And yes. I, someone actually had told me recently, they didn't know anything about Koval. They were looking for whiskey to bring to someone. They saw the OU prominently displayed. They said, oh, you know what? It's kosher. I'm going to grab it and buy it. So that's literally how they got exposed to buying Koval. Oh, I love that. That's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I, and we don't use anything artificial. We're not using mm-hmm. artificial colorings or flavorings or anything that could have bugs in it or, or things that would make it render it not kosher. We're mm-hmm. not doing any of these weird things that, that you might find, um, you know, in tequila distilleries where they distill, you know, through smoked meats or other uh-huh. things that might. Or diffu- yeah. Be, yeah. 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 I mean, chicken, you, there are a lot of things. Chicken over. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, some rum distilleries also do things that would certainly render their products mm. not kosher Mm -hmm. and not even kosher style. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, for us, it's in a way it's very easy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but at the same time, it was very important for us because we really wanted to, you know, we're Jewish company Mm -hmm. and we wanted to make sure that everyone could have L'chaim with what we make. Mm -hmm. And that that was a part of our identity as a brand. I mean, you know, in addition to organic, which, you know, speaks to our love of the environment and, um, agriculture and, and so many things, which also certainly intersect with, you know, Jewish identity, but Mm -hmm. you know, it it was, it was important to us. So, but I feel that, you know, OU certification and kosher for a lot of people also is a way to say, you know, you don't need to, you know, just take our word for it. You know, there Mm -hmm. is a certifying party that comes in and checks everything and not just us, they're checking the whole supply chain. You mm-hmm. know, they're, they're making sure that everything is kosher from start to finish, you know, and that's also true for organic start to finish. We can trace every bottle back to the field on which the grains were grown and mm-hmm. when, you know, so these things I think are important. And in a world in which people care, I think more about where their food is coming from, where their drinks are coming from. I think that these things matter. Hello, I hope you're enjoying the show. I wanted to break in again and see if you, well, hopefully you're enjoying it. And I, in the past, I've asked if anybody has any ideas of what Jewish drinking can do beyond the show, beyond different things we can do. But we have the added benefit, the added bonus that Jewish drinking is now an officially recognized 501c3 organization by the IRS. So that means you it is now tax deductible if you want to make donations and we can see what we can do, what new things we can do. So I'm always open and you are welcome to email me, to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Hopefully you reach out to me and I'm always open to questions, ideas, suggestions, anything you might have. So please feel re- feel free to reach out to me. And thank you. And now back into the show. I like the heat of rye. I like that it stands up in Manhattan against vermouth and cherry. Your rye shocked us last night because it's not hot, it's super approachable. Mm-hmm. Right. It's also it's it's also 40%, it's 80 proof. I was mm-hmm. I was wondering if you have a higher proof rye. Mostly because I'm curious to know if more of that heat shines through in, in the flavor mm-hmm. profile. Again, because the wild turkey I drink is 101. Sure. Um, and it, so I sure. need to rise that are hotter and heavier. And, right. and yours was a, a lower proof that was very approachable. But as somebody that likes rye a lot and likes tea, um, yeah. do, do you have a higher proof version? Are you working on it? Have you thought about it? 
We got it all. So yes, right. you, you've, <laughs> act, you've come to the right place. So yes, indeed, our <laughs> rye is very approachable and that's because yeah. of the heart cut. So it's not going to be as, you know, hot, hot. hit you over um, yeah. because the, the heart cut, it's really, it's, it's just the, the most well-rounded, bright, smooth part of the distillate. That being yeah. said, you know, obviously you get more heat with a higher proof. We do have a bottled in bond that is making the rounds around the U S in allocation. So you can try mm. and look for that. Um, so that should be able to be found in some places, uh, certainly. And we also have in a number of markets, some 55%, 100% rise that are also making the rounds around hmm. various markets. So you can find both 50% in our bottles and bond, and you can find 55% uh, in various barrel programs through different liquor stores. So you gotta you gotta hunt around a little bit, but it's it's out there. Well, Dr. Hart, this has been fantastic. This has been insightful, uh, really great to hear. Thank you. And is there anything you would like to promote? Aside from bottled and bond well, rye. Here we go. Let's try and find that bottled and bond. Uh, we, you or, know, the I, I, or the oat. Or the oats. Or the oats. Yes, <laughs> if you can. Um, you know, I I would I definitely agree with all that's been said about the cranberry gin and that this should be everybody's holiday cocktail. But it certainly isn't limited to winter. I mean, it makes a great summer spritzer too. So yeah. you know, there's that as well. Uh, so anybody down in Florida, the cranberry gin is just as good in a summery <laughs> type cocktail as a wintry one. Um, but I would love to say, come visit us, come to the distillery. You know, we do tours, we do tastings, we do all sorts of things. We have a patio, obviously, as we're getting closer to these colder months, you probably wouldn't want to sit out there uh, in Chicago winters, but it's, you know, we, we love seeing people. We love teaching, uh, telling people how we do things um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're in the joyful business. And, uh, and I think that uh, we love sharing that with people at home and also in spirit. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. I really love the opportunity to chat with you about Koval. It's great. Absolutely. This has been great. Thank you so much. And L'chaim. L'chaim. <laughs>